Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, I do have a couple of things at the top. I'll get to it. Today, the, the Biden-Harris administration announced the next major step to cancel student debt for approximately 30 million Americans when combined with the administration's prior actions, providing them with information about how they can stand to benefit from upcoming debt relief programs. In April, the president announced his administration's new plan to deliver relief to millions of Americans, including those whose balances have grown due to runaway interest and those who have been repaying their loans for a very long time. This is in addition to the nearly 5 million Americans who have already received relief. Despite attempts by Republican elected officials to block our efforts, this administration is committed to fixing our broken student loan system and giving Americans a little bit more breathing room. Next, I want to highlight our new announcement to address the overdose epidemic and save lives. Since day one, the administration, President Biden, and Vice President Harris have prioritized action to combat the scourge of illicit fentanyl and beat this crisis. Leading to the first decline in overdose deaths in five years, these actions include stopping more illicit fentanyl at ports of entry in the last two years than in the last five years combined sanctioning over 300 persons and entities engaged in the illicit drug trade, making naloxone a life-saving opioid overdose, uh, overdose reversal medication widely uh, available over the counter and mobilizing global leaders to join the fight against this global epidemic. Today, the Biden-Harris administration is announcing two new initiatives to build on these ongoing efforts, including a new national security memorandum directing every federal agency and department to do even more to stop the flow of narcotics into the United States, and a call on Congress to pass legislation that would close key loopholes drug traffickers ex exploit, drug traffickers exploit, <laughs> increase penalties on drug tra traffickers, and more. We also continue to call on Congress to pass the Bipartisan Border Security Agreement, which would deliver funding for thousands more border agents and 100 more high-tech drug de detention machines. Congressional Republicans must stop putting partisan politics over American safety and national security. And today, as you can see, we have two guests joining us to speak on both uh, domestic news and foreign, de and foreign developments. Uh, first up, we have, uh, we're joined by Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack to discuss new actions the administration is taking to address the efforts, the, the effects of discrimination in farming and ranching thanks to the President's uh, Inflation Reduction Act. This historic action delivers on a promise the president made to help farmers and ranchers who were unable to access federal resources due to discrimination in farm loan programs. Farmers and ranchers work around the clock to put food on our tables and steward our nation's land. So it is critical we do everything we can to support them especially when they suffer the injustice of discrimination. President Biden will continue to ensure that all Americans, uh, all American farmers specifically and ranchers, have the tools and resources they need to be successful. And with that, Secretary Vilsack, the podium is yours. Thank you. Karine, thanks very much. Uh, as I briefed the President today, uh, the Department of Agriculture has just completed an important step in advancing a key commitment that the President made. We're able to announce today, thanks to Section 22007 of the Inflation Reduction Act, that more than 43,000 individuals in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and American Samoa, are receiving direct financial assistance in response to discrimination that they reported to have experienced at USDA farm lending uh, programs prior to 2021. This action advances a key priority of President Biden and Vice President Harris and they laid out an executive order signed on day one to advance racial equity and to support uh, for underserved communities through the federal government. Now, this financial assistance is not compensation for anyone's loss or the pain endured, but it is an acknowledgement by the department. And our hope is, and the president's hope is, that this financial assistance will help many farmers stay on the farm, contribute to our nation's food supply, and continue to do what they love. The culmination of this program is an important marker in our effort to rebuild trust and to make USDA an equitable and accessible department 
that truly serves all of its customers. And it's the result of a lot of really hard work by many, many people deeply committed to that effort. And as well by third-party third organizations that directly administered this program. This announcement is significant. It represents USDA acknowledging and responding to reported past discrimination, such as racial, gender, or disability discrimination. I'm grateful to the individuals who took time to complete applications and in doing so relived their stories, which I know for many was not an easy task. Our priority has been getting the assistance out the door. Uh, the work will continue as we analyze the information provided, dig into details and assess what it tells us about ways in which we can continue to break down barriers at USDA. Now we're committed uh, to releasing additional information about these awards as our analysis continues. Uh, this is also a milestone in connection with our implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act, which has made historic investments across dozens of USDA programs to keep farmers farming, to invest in climate smart agriculture, and we've worked hard in ways that reach historically underserved and new and beginning farmers. We're supporting the development of a clean and more affordable energy infrastructure, and we're improving the health of our country's forests and making them more resistant to wildfires. To date, we've obligated over $12 billion of that funding, which in many cases has reached the smallest, most rural, and often most under-resourced communities. What the Inflation Reduction Act has done in many cases is to give us the tools at USDA, not just to help people, but to show to them that USDA is open for business, to them. A lot of these changes have been informed by our work uh, implementing another section of the Inflation Reduction Act, Section 22006, which allotted $3.1 billion for farmers in financial distress. Through the 22006 program, we've been able to work directly with over 43,000 farmers as well who had loans through USDA but who were struggling to repay them, providing them some relief. Under Section 22006, in two years, we've distributed $2.4 billion to those nearly 43,000 farmers who were in financial distress. Because of that assistance, many of them have given a second chance at farming and are now able to pass their farms down to the next generation. Our experience in implementing this section of the IRA has also informed many changes at the Farm Service Agency, where our farm loans are made. Changes at FSA under this administration have included, but not necessarily been limited to, diversifying the agency leadership and county committee membership, the ability to apply for farm loans and make loan payments online, which is new this year a streamlined and shortened paperwork requirement and new processes that have reduced the need for human discretion in loan decision making. While the discrimination payments of nearly $2 billion today uh, are a look at the past, what all of this broader work boils down to is learning from that past so we can create a better future, one where everyone who wants to participate in farming and agriculture has a fair shot of doing so and continuing to do so and that all of America's communities, regardless of how rural or remote they may be, are getting the investments they need to thrive. We're truly working uh, to live up to our moniker, the People's Department. And with that, I'd be glad to respond to questions with Hey, uh, Secretary Vilsack, thanks for being here. Um, about a month ago, the uh, uh, USGA released a sort of comment period on climate friendly, assessment of climate friendly policies. I realize that's not what you're here to talk about today, but it is about a month since it came out. And I, I want to ask you, you know, what the comments have been, and but also looking at the possibility that, in fact, former President Trump could be reelected, and uh, you know, how do you secure the changes that you've been able to enact and, and avoid them from being reversed when, uh, if a new administration came in? Let me answer the question uh, generally, uh, without going into specifics about the election, because. As I mentioned to Karina, I don't really want to get arrested for violating the Hatch Act today. Um, what I would say is this. The reason we asked for these comments was we want to inform the Treasury Department's guidance on the development of a new and exciting industry that this administration is fostering, which is the sustainable aviation fuel industry. Uh, it is an industry that's twice the size of the current biofuel industry, and it opens up the opportunity for many, as many as a million new job opportunities in rural America. So we want to make sure that farmers and farming and ranching are able to fully participate in that process. So we ask for information about uh, commodities and or practices that could potentially be established uh, as having a 
positive climate smart benefit because the Treasury Department, for purposes of uh, 45Z, a tax credit that was established under the Inflation Reduction Act, has got to make guidance by the end of the year to provide the industry an awareness of how to qualify the sustainable aviation fuel that's going to be made in the future for that tax credit, which is extremely important because it's what's going to make it cost effective to produce the fuel. So opportunities here for large uh, uh, new income sources for farmers, new products being produced in rural America and, uh, and continuing this administration's commitment to manufacturing in rural places. Uh, so that's why we asked for the information. And I think uh, it's information that I, th that I hope the Treasury Department takes into consideration as it makes a very important decision. What's the timing for the 45Z uh, clean tax? Well, I think the goal is to try to get this done by the end of the year. Thank you. Secretary Vilsack, you detailed many of the programs that USDA is administering under the Inflation Reduction Act, but I'm wondering how much funding the agency has remaining from that legislation and whether you feel any pressure to spend that or disperse it before November. Uh, there, there's not pressure. Um, you want to make sure that you're investing those resources wisely. Uh, I will tell you, for example, we have yet to obligate all of the re renewable energy resources. And the reason we have uh, is because we are in the process of completing the evaluation of the uh, applications for that funding. Uh, when you talk about the transition of, uh, of rural electri electricity from fossil fuel-based transition and generation to more renewable sources, it's complicated. So it takes a while for us to basically analyze those contracts. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting that we will be able to make awards uh, in that program uh, by the end of the year, significant awards, and have a better general sense of what awards will be uh, made in 2025 and 2026. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act was structured so that you would be making payments and investments over a period of time. The Forest Service, for example, was given resources uh, to invest in uh, forest re restoration and, and hazardous fuel uh, buildup removal uh, over a period of years. And so we're on track. In fact, I'd say we were probably a little bit ahead of a schedule in terms of our obligations uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act. So I'm confident that we'll meet the goals that were set by Congress, probably exceed them. Uh, and in doing so, create a lot of new opportunities out there in the countryside. Congress sought to rescind some of the unspent stimulus money uh, during negotiations over other issues, and I'm wondering if you worry that there's a possibility that unspent IRA money could get rescinded. In well, the that would be a serious mistake on the part of Congress to do this because there is genuine interest. The level of applications we received under the IRA would suggest that there is uh, interest above and beyond the amount of money that was uh, provided by Congress. And in that normal, in that circumstance, I think the message that's being sent by rural America is, this is resources that we need, that we want, and we should preserve. Thank you for being here, Mr. Secretary. I think, if I'm not mistaken, earlier this week, you and the USDA announced that there were going to be about 25 separate counties, at least once in our area, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, that. Um, qualified as primary natural disaster areas due to drought conditions. Clearly, we've been keeping an eye on this and keeping with the conversation about climate change. Can you give us a better understanding of where you have seen this go and what the impact has been in terms of um, the American investment required to help sort of accommodate these communities and where it is going? Well, I can tell you that the uh, we have a number of programs, and if you're interested in knowing all of the programs that are impacted by drought or any other disaster, we have a a tool on our website, Disaster at a Glance, which will tell you, based on the criteria, whether it's a tornado or a flood or whatever it might be, what programs are available. Uh, the fact that we have that document uh, would suggest that we are aware of the fact that there's an ever-increasing number and intensity of these events, and they are, in some cases, horrific, and they are extraordinarily expensive uh, because they impact not only the ability to make a living for farmers, ranchers, and producers, and forested landowners, but it also results in devastations of homes and businesses. Um, we're now seeing floods that are supposed to be 100-year floods occurring every six months. We're, we're seeing droughts that are supposed to last for a year, la lasting for multiple years, in fact, uh, over a decade. Uh, we're seeing tornadoes uh, that are just incredibly powerful. Uh, I didn't know what a derecho was uh, until a couple of years ago, so the very the fact that we have things that I've never heard of in my life now coming up on a regular basis in the Midwest tells you that there's something going on here, which is why it's important for this administration and for future administrations to continue to invest in climate smart practices. Frankly, 
it isn't just about dealing with the climate issue. It's about creating a, a whole new American economy that creates new job opportunities and, as the president likes to talk about, rebuilding that middle class. Because when you do climate smart practices, you are essentially creating supply chains, you're creating new industries, you're creating new and innovative ways to do things, all of which is going to require people that work with their head and their hands. So whether you're concerned about climate or whether you want to build an American economy that's stronger, you got to continue to invest in these, in these practices. And, and uh, you know, I think fortunately we have the tools for the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure law and the American Rescue Plan to do a lot of that work right now. Thank you Sorry. so much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, and now I'm going to turn it over to Admiral John Kirby to talk about the Middle East uh, developments that we've seen over the last 24 hours or so. Okay. Hey everybody, just a quick note on Venezuela, too, before we can get into any of that. Uh, I want to note that our patience and that of the international community is running out running out on waiting for the Venezuelan electoral authorities to come clean and release the full detailed data on this election so that everyone can see the results. You may have seen the Carter Center, an independent observer, just earlier this morning released a report stating that, quote, Venezuela's 2024 presidential election did not meet international standards of electoral integrity and cannot be considered democratic. They concluded that the quote, electoral authorities' failure to announce disaggregated results by polling station constitutes a serious breach of electoral principles. We share those concerns. Matter of fact, this afternoon, the Organization of American States Permanent Council is going to hold a meeting to address the results of the electoral process in Venezuela. I'm not going to get ahead of that meeting, of course. I would simply reiterate that the United States joins other democracies in the region and actually around the world in expressing serious concerns about these subversions of democratic norms. Now, as you all know, the Venezuelan people have taken to the streets to demand that their votes be counted. You can't very well blame them for that. We have serious concerns about the reports of casualties, violence, and arrests, including the arrest warrants that my Maduro and his representatives issued today for opposition leaders. We condemn political violence and repression of any kind. And our hearts, of course, go out to all the families that have lost a loved one or facing injuries they got to try to recover from. Alongside the international community, we're watching, and we're going to respond accordingly. Now, as Kareen uh, alluded to, um, I know that uh, you're all interested a whole heck of a lot in events that occurred uh, in the last 24, 48 hours in Iran and Lebanon. I want to manage expectations here um, and let you know that there's going to be a, a, a significant limit uh, as to the operational detail or anything else that I can talk about today. Um, so I just as, a, as that is precursor, I just want to let you know I'm, 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 happy to, I'm happy to take the questions. I don't know that you're going to like all the answers. Well, with, those, with our expectations tempered, um, can you talk about whether the United States had any previous knowledge of the assassination beforehand? No. Uh, again, I'm not in a position to just want to... St uh, no, you can't say that we had knowledge or no, we had no knowledge. Well, you throw your voice pretty well all the way to the back of the room. I, you just need a puppet. Let me just clarify here. I am uh, I'm not in a position to confirm the reports coming out of Tehran. I've seen the statement that Hamas put out. I can't confirm or, or verify. We have no independent confirmation. Um, but I can uh, but I can state that I also have no conversations. Uh, around that reporting that I could speak to today. And can you talk about um, the White House's view on, a potential, on an impact on a potential ceasefire and how much this uh, complicates and delays the prospect of one? It's always been a complicated process. I mean, my goodness, how many times have we talked about it in the last few months and even in just the last few weeks? I think it's too soon to know what any of these reported events uh, could mean for the ceasefire deal. Um, but if I could add two points, one is that doesn't mean we're going to stop working on it. In fact, we have a team in the region right now as we speak uh, to try to continue to work with our counterparts to move this forward because it's that important. Um, and number two, as I kind of alluded to earlier, it's always been complicated work. And it's not like the complications with every passing day get easier. Um, and that includes today. Our job since the beginning of this conflict 
um, in addition to making sure Israel has what it needs to defend itself, in addition to making sure the people of Gaza aren't suffering more than they already are, is to manage risk in the region. One of the things the president's been very focused on is trying to prevent escalation here. That work is complicated and difficult every day, and that includes today. Good day. Thanks, Green. Thanks, Admiral. Um, Admiral, earlier this week you said that um, fears of an all-out war in the Middle East were exaggerated. Is that still your assessment, the White House's assessment of the situation following the, these latest strikes? We don't believe that an escalation is inevitable. Um, and there's no signs that an escalation is imminent. But I also said that we watch it very, very closely. I also said, just and, and said again today, that this is something that we've been concerned about since the 7th of October. It's not like we're brushing off concerns at all. We're watching this very, very closely, and it's been a, a chief concern of the president. And will the White House be urging restraint from Israel? For like this? I, I'm not going to talk about our diplomatic discussions with our Israeli counterparts. Um, we have been working hard to keep this war from escalating. Um, just as we've been working very hard and are today to make sure Israel has what it needs to defend itself. Okay. Thanks. Um, can you tell us, was the president briefed on this last night as the reports started coming out and how he's been informed about this uh, throughout the day? The president was briefed uh, on reports coming out of the Middle East. Um, he uh, routinely, I, I'm not going to get into the specific timing of the parameters of it, but he has been kept fully informed, as you would expect that he would be from the national security team, and that means on a continuous basis as well. Um, Egypt's foreign minister said in a statement that the assassinations undermine the strenuous efforts made by Egypt and its partners to stop the war in the Gaza Strip. You had just said uh, in an earlier answer that it doesn't mean that the United States would stop working toward a ceasefire deal, but can you talk about the concerns about the negotiators continuing that work and what this means about that going forward? I would just tell you as we're standing here today, they're still at that work, and we've got a team in the region, and we're going to we're going to keep the shoulder to the wheel. It's that important. And we still believe the gaps are narrow enough to be closed. We still believe the details can be hashed out. It's too soon to know, based on the reporting over the last 24, 48 hours, what impact any of this is going to have on the ceasefire deal. It was always complicated. It remains complicated. And, um, and reports coming out of the region, as we've seen again over the last 24 to 48 hours, certainly don't make it less complicated. Has there been contact with Egypt and Qatar to reassure them to stay in these conversations right now? I would just say that we have and maintain routine communications with our counterparts in Egypt and in Qatar and with Israel. Those, com those communications are ongoing. Okay. Just to be clear about that, has the U.S. reached out or had contact either directly or indirectly with Iran since the occurrence? I have no diplomatic conversations to speak to, certainly none of that type. So just to be clear, you, there have not been with them or with any of their, uh, any intermediaries, or you can't tell us if there have or have not I have no conversations to speak to. Okay. Um, fundamentally, is an Iranian response here inevitable? Look, you've seen the comments by the Supreme Leader uh, and what he said publicly. It's out there for everybody to see. Um, I'll certainly... Um, not speculate about uh, whether and to what degree uh, Iran does anything. Um, what I can tell you is we have and will maintain a level of readiness to preserve our national security interest in the region. It's not like we take a blind eye to what Iran is capable of doing and has shown their capability of doing in the region. It's not like we've uh, demonstrated an unwillingness uh, to defend Israel. Uh, from threats in the region, including from Iran, if that happens. Um, and we maintain that capability and that readiness to do so now. I would also say, lastly, Peter, what I said earlier, we don't want to see an escalation. And everything we've been doing since the 7th of October, we've been trying to manage that risk. Those risks go up and down every day. They are certainly up right now. They don't make the task of de-escalation, deterrence, and dissuasion, which is the goal, any, uh, any less complicated. So to be clear, does the U.S. think this action was escalatory, provocative, justified? As I said earlier, I'm not in a position to verify the, uh, uh, the accounts. Thank you, Corinne. Um, John, I have two uh, questions on Middle East and then on Russia and Ukraine. So on the Middle East, besides of Egypt, we see uh, Qatar, China and Russia all contain the killing. Uh, saying the killing would jeopardize the ceasefire talks. What is the White House response to those countries' reaction to this? And also, is the United States warring China expanding its influence in the Middle East and may not be using its influence for the purpose that U.S. and allies believe to be positive? 
on the first thing, I, I believe I've already kind of addressed this. I'm not in a position to verify the reporting, certainly the statement by Hamas. I'm just not going to do that. On China, we've said many times uh, we would welcome any credible role by China or any other nation, um, uh, whether they're in the region or not, that, that want to uh, help get involved and de-escalate the tensions and help us bring this war to a close and make sure that Israel's security is guaranteed going forward. Any other nation's contributions that can be done in a credible, transparent, and sustainable way would be welcome. We've simply not seen that coming out of the PRC. In the Russia and Ukraine, uh, this United States knows the whereabouts of Paul Whelan. And can you confirm the report that the first delivery of F-16 jets in Ukraine? Look, on your first one, uh, all I'll say is that uh, we have been consistently, since the beginning of this administration, working hard to bring home Americans that are wrongfully detained overseas. And the, the attention that the president has paid personally to the cases of Paul Whelan and to Evan Gersh Gershkovich uh, from the Wall Street Journal uh, is very, very high, as is the whole team. And we continue to work at that uh, uh, very, very uh, diligently. On the second question, you'd have to talk to the Ukrainians. I'm certainly not going to talk about weapons capabilities. I will only add that, to remind, as we have said and said at the NATO summit, that uh, the process of providing F-16s to Ukraine uh, continues to move forward. We've said that they will be operational by the end of the summer. We have no reason to doubt that. Thank you so much, Karine. Hi, John. On um, Venezuela, uh, two questions. One about the call with President Lula yesterday. Uh, did President Biden ask anything specific from the Brazilian president, any kind of help to moderate the situation in Venezuela? The president was grateful for the time with President Lula. Uh, they obviously talked about the electoral results in Venezuela and our concerns about uh, where that's uh, leading to. I, I won't go beyond the readout, though, in terms of specific asks. Uh, the president was grateful for President Lula's time. Uh, and another one, because uh, as you were saying, the United States and other countries like Brazil are asking for the full release of the voting count. Uh, but three days later, as you were saying, the patient's running out. There is no indication that Maduro will release giving to this international pressure and release the data uh, on the opposite. As you were saying, there is violence now. They're persecuting people protesting against yeah. the results. So uh, does the U.S. still believe that Maduro can be convinced to release this data? And how long is the U.S. willing to wait? What they, is the strategy? They, they need to release it. We've been calling for it. As I said, our patience is running out. Those, those electoral authorities uh, which obviously worked for Mr. Maduro, they need to release the, the, the data, the tabulated data, so the world can see exactly what happened here. Um, and we're going to continue to call for that. And as for consequences, I won't get ahead of policy decisions that haven't been made yet. Okay. Does the White House recognize that um, Edmund Gonzalez won the election? Uh, again, we want to see the full tabulated data from the polling places. We want to see something that can be verifiable and can... can uh, uh, and can convince not only the United States, but the international community about what the results actually were. Okay, a couple more. Go ahead in the back. <clears throat> hi, hi, John. Two of Al Jazeera journalists were killed today in Gaza, Ismail al Ghul and his cameraman uh, Rami al Rifi, uh, in an Israeli airstrike. It was obvious they were journalists, everything was clear that they were journalists and were targeted. Are you condemning this? And do you have any other reaction regarding the killing of journalists? It's continuing since uh, October 7th. I don't have any specifics about this particular strike to speak to, so it's diff difficult for me to get into any detailed discussion of it. Um, we obviously uh, continue to not only recognize and honor the service that journalists do around the world, particularly in places like Gaza. It's very dangerous. It's a combat zone. We know that that uh, takes a special kind of bravery for a, a journalist to go on the ground in, in a place like that. And we want to make sure, as I think Kareen has mentioned herself in, in just the last day or so, that press freedoms uh, are observed and recognized and respected and that reporters are allowed to do their job. And that includes covering the war uh, in Gaza. But I just don't have any detail on this particular strike to be able to, uh, uh, to characterize it one way or the other. Obviously, our hearts go out to the families and, uh, and all those who are touched and affected by this, by this terrible loss. John, um, just I know, I know we've talked about what you've said before about the um, temperature going down, but Secretary Austin also spoke about this and said that the sense was that the temperature was going down in the Middle East. So can you say to what extent this uh, um, this doesn't help?
surprise? Like, was, was these the U.S. Reports over the, these reports over the last 24, 48 hours certainly don't help with the temperature going down. I'm not going to be Pollyannish about it. We're obviously concerned about escalation. And again, without confirming the reports over the last 24 in terms of Tehran, uh, certainly the IDF has already spoken to operations that they've conducted elsewhere. Um, uh, all of this adds to the complicated nature of what we're trying to get done. And what we're trying to get done is a ceasefire deal that can get you six weeks in phase one, get a lot of hostages, the most at risk out of there and home with their families and get some more humanitarian assistance in there. I know I keep coming back to that, uh, but it's important that we do keep coming back to that because that's what we're really trying to drive at. And if we can get to phase one, by God, we can maybe get to phase two. And if you can get to phase two, maybe you can get a cessation of hostilities. When you have events, dramatic events, violent events uh, caused by whatever actors, it certainly doesn't make the task of achieving that outcome any easier. But, you know, who is Israel supposed to negotiate with if the leader of Hamas is dead? Again, I can't confirm the reports coming uh, out of Tehran or Hamas's statements. We still believe there's a viable process. We still believe there's interested counterparts. And we still believe that there are meetings and discussions to be had. We wouldn't have a team over there right now if we didn't believe that it was possible to, to try to uh, gather gather together and, and push this forward. Okay, just ask for that. Thank you. Uh, follow up on her question. What is the U.S. strategy for Venezuela if Maduro is still be considered a winner? Is, is the U.S. planning to impose more sanctions? or? It's a terrific hypothetical question that I'm not going to answer. I would simply say that we'll reserve uh, uh, our rights and our abilities uh, uh, in terms of consequences one way or another based on what we see coming out of the electoral authorities in Venezuela. It's in their interest, too, to be fully transparent and credible about what happened on Sunday. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where this goes. If you consider to be the winner, what, what the U.S. planning to do? Well, let's see the results. Let's see the results. Good, Andrew, and then we John. Two questions for you. Uh, you said there's a team in the region uh, from the U.S. You, you've said there are interested uh, counterparts to, to speak to. Uh, who are they, and why would they show up to these talks, given that the guy who was heading the talks for Hamas is, is now dead? What reason do they have to, to poke their heads up above ground? And then I have a second one. As I also said, it, it's too soon to know what these reports are going to mean for the ceasefire deal. What we do know is we have a team in the region. What we do know is we want to keep having these conversations, and we believe they're still worth having. We also haven't seen any indications at 2.07 uh, on Wednesday afternoon here, the 31st of July, that the process has been completely torpedoed and it ain't worth pursuing. So we're going to keep pursuing it. So, uh, on, on the process being torpedoed completely or otherwise, uh, my colleagues and I have spoken to family members of hostages who are still being held, and, and the view among many of them is that uh, Netanyahu and his government do not want to deal, uh, and Netanyahu in particular does not want to deal because if there is a deal and the war ends, his government collapses and he possibly uh, continues on trial for corruption and goes to prison. Does the president still believe that uh, the prime minister is acting in good faith here? Based on the constructive conversations that we had with the prime minister last week, we still believe that this is a worthy endeavor. We still believe that the gaps can be narrowed, the details can be fleshed out, and a deal can be had. Now again, it's too soon to know what these recent events over the last 24, 48 hours are going to do to the process. I don't want to sound overly sanguine here, but we still believe the deal on the table is worth pursuing and the hostages need to come home and, and we're not going to stop trying to work on that. Those conversations, all, all of them took place before uh, the events of, of the last uh, few days. Uh, is the president open to changing his view uh, based on what has happened? I mean, I, I've never known President Biden to ever not be willing to, to look at things with a fresh set of eyes. Um, and as I said earlier, it's just too soon to know, with the reports coming out of the region, what kind of impact there's going to be on the ceasefire deal. What I can tell you he hasn't changed his mind on is 
we got it that we want to get the deal that we want to pursue it that the deal on the table is a good one both sides ought to accept it they ought to sit down in earnest and hash through these details that have to be fleshed out and and and, uh, and close the gaps that we believe can be closed and let's move forward let's get phase one in in place he hasn't changed his mind on that not at all thank you, thank you so much admiral Thanks. appreciate it okay um just have one thing at the top uh, so I wanted to uh, mention that the President and the First Lady and the entire administration are proudly cheering on Team USA. The women of USA Gymnastics brought home a gold medal with an unbelievable performance. And Simone Biles now has more Olympic medals than any U.S. gymnast in history. And the U.S. men's gymnastics team brought home their first medal in six years. But it's not just our gymnasts that are winning big. The U.S. swim team have scored gold in two contests and the women's rugby team won their first ever Olympic medal with an incredible win. From tennis, soccer, and basketball to fencing, track, and volleyball, our nation's athletes are making us all proud. Our athletes are, as the president said, the big reason so many of us believe we can do big things. And not to brag too much, but USA is also currently uh, leading the Olympic Games with the most medals. As the First Lady said ahead of the opening ceremony, and I quote, our athletes carry more than just our flag. They carry our nation's heart and our hopes with them too. So we wish the team, all the team of uh, the Team USA, all of them, good luck. As they continue to make us proud, we are especially excited to see the women's soccer team and the men's basketball team in action today. I'm wearing my Olympic Team USA gear, so go Team USA. But we wanted to lift them up from uh, from the briefing room today. Hopefully you guys didn't mind. Go ahead, so <laughs> <laughs> Um I know you typically don't discuss the lunches between the president and the vice president, but yeah. since we're kind of in a unique time, do you have any sort of details or color or what the president planned to talk about with her? So again, I, I just want to be, and I, and I, you're right, we are in a, a different time, and I get the question, always are, are very respectful of the president and the vice president's private conversations, and obviously they do regularly meet, and, uh, and it, whether it's for a lunch or meetings about the national security, uh, and they do that regularly, whether even White House events and just many much more, uh, they have t stayed in touch regularly uh, over the past couple, couple of weeks, but they, couple days, couple of weeks, but they do that uh, normally as well. So it's nothing new there, uh, but I don't want to uh, get into their private uh, discussion. Uh, as you know, the president is incredibly proud of the vice president and what she has been able to accomplish their, their partnership uh, together Together and is going to continue to support her. Um, and I know you've said that we would continue to see President Biden at work on the job, but he's had a lot of yeah. things on his calendar just today that were all close press. Some of them seem like things we would have seen um, at least at the top of the top of the meeting. So is that going to be the standard operating procedure going no, forward? No, it's not. You'll, you're gonna. I can tell you right now, you could expect to see from him and hear him tomorrow, uh, the president, uh, or later this week, I should say, to be more specific. But tomorrow's already Thursday. But you'll hear from him uh, later this week. Uh, I promise you that. Um, look, every every uh, event is access is we assess it uh, differently as it relates to press uh, access to Secretary Vilsack. We brought him to the podium because you wanted to make sure you heard directly uh, from him on their conversation. They met obviously this morning to talk about this new announcement uh, as it relates, relates to the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and he's going to continue to get briefings uh, all day. We, I talked about the fentanyl announcement, but it will not be uh, the norm. It will not. You will see you will hear from the president uh, later this week, and uh, he definitely wants to continue uh, to to have to make sure you have access. He had a you know a little bit of a, a, a press conference, if you will, at 1:15 in the morning the other day, uh, and so he certainly wants to continue to take your questions and see all of you, and so that that's that's not going to stop. So uh, I don't have anything to share at this time, but certainly we will, as as you all know, when uh, when we lock things in, uh, we certainly will share that. But we, you will see him. You will see and hear from him for sure later this week. And you're this is your first time in the front row. Hi. Yes, I appreciate it. Thanks will, for will? welcome. Yeah. Hi, good will. to see you. Good, good to see you. See you. Uh, just staying on the vice president. I know you yeah. can't talk about uh, their meeting and whatnot, but in terms of medical records and physical, are we going to see a little bit of sunlight on the vice president's health 
as we get closer to the election. So uh, I know there was a lot, we were getting some incoming on this, and I know there's a lot of interests. Uh, the vice president's office asked that you refer those, que I, we refer those questions to her office, and so they will be glad, gladly uh, able to take those questions from all of you. And just one other question I wanted to ask as well. The president had previously committed to talk to black journalists at NABJ. I don't know if you're attending or going to Chicago for NABJ. Uh, we've seen you there before. Uh, he's no longer a candidate, and there's some back and forth between the Harris campaign and NABJ. Yeah. But does the president have a message? Uh, for those black journalists there at the conference. So April Ryan asked me a question about this yesterday. And, and look, we, it, when it comes to black journalists, we want to make sure, and, and obviously in all Americans, uh, including black journalists, that we uh, have an opportunity. And obviously talking to black journalists is obviously talking to uh, uh, the community. And so it's important that uh, we do interviews as we've normally done with black-owned uh, publications, and we have done that from the president to the vice president to myself to other senior uh, members of his team because we understand how important uh, to have uh, that, uh, that, that kind of entry point into the community. And so that is something that we have been very proud of doing the past three and a half years, and we will certainly uh, continue to do that as it relates to NABJ. Uh, that it was a campaign decision, so I would have to obviously refer you to the campaign. Um, the president, as you know, is no longer a candidate, which is why he's not speaking uh, this year. And so as it relates to the vice president as well, that is something for her office uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, speak to. But it is important for us to, to speak to, uh, whether it's a radio host, a TV host, or uh, a newspaper reporter, we do that on the regular. Uh, and it is something that we have been proud uh, to do because we believe that we have been able to deliver for the community, all communities, uh, whether it's the economy, health care, uh, issues that they really truly care about. Uh, and so we're going to continue to do that certainly for the next six months. Okay, Jackie. Thank you, Craig. Just following up on Sun Vin's question, could you sort of give us an idea of how much the president's schedule has changed since the ticket changed because if you look at what we look at the big event on tuesday was a phone call the big event today is a lunch tomorrow we don't know what he's doing friday he heads to delaware yeah. it lends itself to the <clears throat> appearance that he's done governing no, he's not done governing at all. I think that appearance would be false. It would be a, a misled appearance. I, I understand the question, but I will say we were in Austin on Monday. We were uh, obviously in Texas. We went to Austin, went to Houston. He went to pay his respect to the late Congresswoman. Uh, he went to Austin to make uh, a very uh, important announcement as we went back and forth on this uh, yesterday on SCOTUS reform, which is something that majority of Americans want to see. We got back. We landed. Uh, on, on Marine One on the South Lawn at one o'clock in the morning, took some questions. That was something that he wanted to do. Uh, took a couple of questions from press. We were out for about 12 hours. Uh, he continues to meet with his team today. And as I said, you will see him uh, later this week. You will hear from him directly later this week. Uh, and I think, again, I'm gonna throw Matt Visor here into the conversation. Uh, we are recalibrating. I mean, that is very true. I mean, there there is a, there is a change uh, uh, in, in just him stepping down uh, for re-election. He's still very much the president, and we're trying to figure out what the next six months are gonna look like. Uh, but we are committed. The president is steadfast on continuing to build on the unprecedented record uh, that he has had with the vice president over the last three and a half years. That doesn't change, uh, but just give us a beat, and, and we certainly uh, will, be, uh, will be out there. And the president does want to uh, continue to, to speak directly to the American people. You will see him. We heard from him, for instance, on the news unfolding in the Middle East. We heard from Secretary Blinken. We heard from Secretary Austin. We heard from the Vice President. It would be something that ordinarily we'd expect to Stay tuned. Him. Stay tuned. I just said that you're going to hear from the President later this week. And, and look, I think when it comes to the Middle East, when it comes to foreign policy more broadly, this is a President uh, that has a record uh, to stand on uh, when it relates to making sure we're putting the national security of the American people first. This is something that he's done, making sure that we, uh, you know, that we re-engage with our allies and also our partners. We saw what happened in the La Paz administration. The president had to fix those relationships, and he did that in the last three and a half years. When you think about reinvigorating a NATO, you think about how uh, the people of Ukraine have has what it needs now uh, to defend it itself against Russia's aggression so they can fight for their democracy and freedom. This is a pr president that has a, a long list of uh, foreign policy accomplishments that he's incredibly proud of. And when it comes to the Middle East, the president has been incredibly engaged. 
age. Uh, from, uh, from certainly from day one of what uh, we have been seeing the developments there over the past uh, just under a year. Uh, but uh, he's going to continue to do that. You're going to continue to hear from him. And that will not change. Get on. Um, so on the um, potential comment from the president of the Middle East, can you say anything more about what the venue would be? And and then I'm just well, I just said he will. You'll continue to hear from him, and I said you'll see him certainly later this week. That's what I can I can speak to. So next week, um, Vice President Harris is going to Detroit. The UAW has just endorsed her ahead of um, a rally that'll be taking place in Detroit. Um, the administration began work on an Islamophobia strategy last year. Do you and have any kind of an update for us on what's going on with that? Like, when are we seeing results? This, you know, next week might be a good opportunity to sort of give an update on that, especially since uh, Vice President Harris will be speaking then, you know, in a, in a community where there are a lot of Muslims and a lot of people who've been very concerned, particularly about yeah. the Yeah, so that, I, I have to be careful on that because it's a campaign event, so I can't speak to what exactly she's going to be doing. You just mentioned uh, the endorsement, so that's certainly for the campaign to speak to. But as you uh, asked me about the uh, the strategy that we have put forward, look, uh, our, the strategy that we've put forward on anti-Semitism, anti-Islamophobia uh, is uh, the first of its kind. Uh, we took, we are taking that incredibly seriously, and we wanted to put together an all-government effort uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, we uh, are to make sure that Americans here uh, feel safe and to know that this administration is taking, uh, is certainly taking awareness and doing everything that we can uh, from an all government approach uh, to deal with this, uh, whether it's through uh, the Department of Education, Homeland Security, uh, and, and uh, Department of Justice. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an issue uh, that uh, is, is incredibly important and we are going to condemn, uh, continue to condemn any type of uh, hatred against any community. That is something that we believe that that is there's no place uh, in 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 this nation for any type of violence, uh, and so the president continues to be steadfast on this, continue to speak on this. I don't have an up update uh, on. Um, uh, on any of this at this time, but we have throughout uh, the past year or so announced uh, new actions. We'll certainly continue to do that. But as for today or even next week, uh, don't have anything specifically to, to, to point out to you. I just want to follow up on that. Yeah. The president has met, obviously, with you know uh, various people who are interested in this issue and the unfolding and just the violence in the Middle yeah. East. With the escalation that we've seen, with the concerns about an all-out war, um, rising now, you know, the risks that uh, John just outlined too. Um, is the president intending to uh, carry out any further outreach, or is the White House planning further outreach to affected communities? So we are in, in regular touch. The we have, a, as you know, we have the White House Office of Public Engagement into governmental affairs here, and they are in regular touch with communities out there. And we understand that communities are fearful. Uh, they're feeling some pain here, and we get that. And that's why, as an administration, we're trying to address uh, the rise of reported anti-Semitism, the rise of uh, reported and what we have seen Islamophobic uh, incidents. Uh, and we're, we're talking about, sadly, at schools, right? We're talking about at college campuses and in communities. And so this is something that we take very seriously. As you know, uh, not too long ago, we did make some new announcements on actions that we were taking uh, here in the administration. Uh, and so we're going to continue to work towards that. Uh, and uh, to your, but to your question, we are in regular touch uh, with communities, hearing them out, hearing also how can we be helpful, uh, any anything that they want to share with us that would be helpful to us, and how uh, we continue uh, to uh, provide assistance and uh, and um, you know come up with uh, actions uh, that's going to be uh, helpful to them. I mean we've. We've announced more than 100 new actions uh, in the past year uh, to deal with this type of hate. And so we t we're taking this very seriously. And it's an all of government uh, approach here. Okay, okay. Thank you, Karine. Uh, you said that with each event the president does, there's a discussion about whether to open it up to press and in what way. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the rationale behind not showing the president on two days where the vice president now has public events of her own. Is there 
a desire to not have the president out there publicly while she's campaigning? I mean, look, I, I'm not going to uh, get into uh, uh, I, I'm not going to get into the campaign specifics here. Uh, what I will say is that uh, you will you will get to see this, the president later this week. Uh, and uh, look, it's a case by case basis. Uh, and that's kind of how we've always moved forward with uh, with when we think about uh, these different events that we do here. Uh, the president will be out later this week. You'll get to see him. Uh, he will speak directly uh, to all of you and to the American people. Obviously, I just don't have anything to share beyond that. But specifically yesterday and today, the rationale for not having him up here. Help I, I just don't have any specifics here. Uh, it is assessed by an array of people, not just by my office. Uh, we tried to, to figure out uh, what's the appropriate way of getting of, of giving briefings to the president. Uh, and so, you know, he and Secretary Vilsack, for example, had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, they wanted to, to check in. They wanted to talk about this particular piece of the Inflation Reduction Act and how it's going to uh, certainly help uh, communities. Uh, uh, obviously black farmers in, in this regard and so that is was part of the conversation but I just don't have anything else specifically you are we will see the president later this week you saw this the president uh, he was out for 12 hours on on Monday uh, spoke to all of you took a couple of questions uh, and you'll con you'll certainly continue to see that and in that 1 15 a.m. Um, discussion with with press rain sort of questions he was asked about yeah. Um, whether he would weigh in or, or have a discussion with the vice president on her running mate, and he said, we'll talk. Is today that talk? <laughs> Has it happened <laughs> in the interim? I appreciate you all trying. Uh, um, I, I really do not have more to add uh, to what the president said to, to your colleagues, at, as you said, at 1.15 in the morning, uh, on, on, I guess, Tuesday morning. Uh, I just don't have anything else to add. That is obviously when it comes to that particular um, decision. That's something for her uh, to make, and and we trust that she will make that decision for what works for the American people. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kareem. Oh no. No, Joey. Joey. You've never called uh -oh. me Michael. Before. I know. It's been. I know. <laughs> it's been. I know. It's been a while. Well, it's been a sorry, while. Sorry. Hey, what's President Biden's reaction been so far on the strong? Uh, initial enthusiasm that Democratic voters are showing for Kamala Harris's candidacy. She had a rally in Atlanta last night with over 10,000 people, raised more than $2 million, $200 million a week, has improved on polling in battleground states from where Biden was. Does the president feel reassured about his decision to drop out uh, of the election by what he's seen so far <coughs> from Harris? I'm going to ask you, wouldn't you, what would you, wouldn't you be reassured? <laughs> no, but you just listed out uh, what's occurred the past week. I don't even know. Everything is just coming all together uh, past week or so. Uh, again, campaign, don't want to get into specifics of, of numbers that you just ticked off and, and what we've seen. Uh, but, I mean, look, you just listed off um, some pretty incredible moments that we've seen uh, with her campaign over the last uh, week or so. And so, uh, it, look, I think at the end of the day, what I can say, and I've said this before and I'll repeat it, is the president is incredibly proud of the vice president, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. And he has said, he has said that the reason why he chose her, the reason why he picked her to be his vice president back in 2020, almost, gosh, almost four years ago, is because he believes she could lead on day one. And that we have to remember who the vice president is. She's been vice president for almost three and a half years. She's helped uh, be a partner in really big decisions that we've had to make here, whether it's domestic or foreign policy. She was a senator. She was an attorney general. Uh, she is incredibly qualified, and he could not think of anybody else who, who could have done this job, that he could have made this decision uh, and um, uh, to, to take over the campaign, obviously. And so he's very proud of her. Uh, and I will just leave it there. And so he does feel reassured by that decision. I, I mean, he's proud of his decision. He's proud of his decision. Uh, and you just listed out a long list of reasons of why. Okay, Peter. If I can ask you about something that's happening at the NABJ right now, Donald Trump is speaking to some of the reporters who assembled there, and right out of the gates there was what can best be described as a contentious exchange where the former president said, I'm asking this through the lens of someone who represents the president, vice president, not someone who has to speak uh, as a campaign question. Yeah. He says of Kamala Harris, the vice president, she was always of Indian heritage and she was only promoting Indian heritage. I didn't know she was black. 
until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black, he said, and now she wants to be known as black. So I didn't know, is she Indian or is she black? Wow. She has always, a, uh, this is unclear, I respect either one, but she obviously doesn't because she was Indian all the way and then all of a sudden she made a turn and she went black. Your response to those comments. <laughs> Uh, he is a candidate, so I'm going to be super careful. You're Wait, no, 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 hold on, okay. hold on. I, I have more to say. I certainly have more to say. As a person of color, as a black woman who is in this position that is standing before you at this podium behind this lectern, what he just said, what you just read out to me, is repulsive. It's insulting. And, you know, no one has any right to tell someone who they are, how they identify, that is no one's right. It is someone's own decisions. Uh, it is, uh, I'll add this, only she can speak to her experience. Only she can speak to what it's like. She's the only person that can do that. And I think it's insulting for anybody, it doesn't matter if it's a former leader, a former president, it, it is insulting. And we have to put, she is the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. We have to put some respect on her name, period. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Go ahead, John, all the way in the back. Uh, thanks, Green. Can you talk about what efforts are being undertaken as it relates to those wrongfully detained Americans? people like Evan Gershkovich and Paul Whelan. Are there renewed efforts in terms of trying to win their release right now? So I'm going to just repeat a little bit of what my colleague said just moments ago, Admiral, uh, the Admiral. And um, look, what he said was spot on, uh, which is this is a president uh, that has made it a priority to get home wrongfully detained Americans uh, back to their families, back to their loved ones. It is something, and all you have to do is look at his record and what he's been able to do in getting home uh, wrongfully detained Americans. And so he's committed to that. He will continue to be committed to that through these, the next uh, several months, the next six months. Uh, we are careful here. We do not negotiate in public. We cannot negotiate in public uh, because we want to make sure uh, that we get this job done, get this work done. I do not have any specifics. I would not be able to do that uh, from here because we want to be mindful. We want to be careful. But the president's committed uh, to make sure that we get wrongfully detained Americans uh, home to their friends and families and loved ones, obviously. Those efforts yeah. in terms of trying to get those wrongfully detained Americans home, could they possibly involve a third country, a prison swap uh, involving Germany, for instance? Is that a possibility? I, I just cannot get into specifics from here. You have to understand that what we're trying to do is on behalf of uh, Americans who are detained, the president is committed. He is committed and will continue to do everything that he can to get Americans home to their uh, loved ones. Uh, and you've seen that. You've seen that over the last three and a half years. I'm not going to get into specifics. I'm not going to get into details. I can't confirm anything from here or lay out. Uh, what we're going to do is continue to do the work. Just a follow-up on the scheduling question. Yeah, sure. Um, as the president dials back a bit of late the public events, yeah. are we to read into that either now or in the near future that the vice president should be the kind of primary messenger of the administration's policies? No, the president's going to be certainly the messenger of the policies. He's the president of the United States. He's going to continue that. They both will be. Uh, as she's out there as well as vice president, uh, that is not going to change. You will hear from the president. You will hear from the president. He wants to be out there. He believes there's a, still a lot of work to get done in the next six months. He wants to lay out uh, what it is that uh, he would like to get done, building on our successes, whether it's the whether it's healthcare, whether it's the economy. There's still a lot of more work uh, to do in the economy, even though we're leading uh, the world in what we've been able to do here to turn to restart the economy. Uh, and so. Look, you're going to hear from the president uh, about this in a short order. You're going to see the president later this week. You're going to hear from him. Uh, and so I would say stay tuned. Uh, and uh, the president certainly is looking forward to the next six months, uh, continuing to, uh, to, to lay out uh, his plans for, uh, on behalf of the American people. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, when are we going to see the president and vice president together? That's a good question. I don't have anything for you right now at this time. Uh, but. Uh, uh, 
obviously they were together today having lunch. That was a private discussion, private uh, private lunch. Uh, but uh, I, I, I could assure you, you all will see them together at some point. I do want to ask you about the border security legislation that yeah. the president still wants um, and that uh, the Vice President Harris is also talking about. Would the president be willing to make a deal on that in the in the lame duck session when Congress is back? Yeah, I, I get the question, but he did make a deal. That was what we did, what, two months with Republicans in the Senate? Yes, we made, but they, they stopped right. agreeing to that. It's, but it's, it's, it's so wild because we worked with Republicans and with Democrats, and if this deal in Congress, obviously, in the Senate, to be more specific, and if this deal would have gone through, it would have been the toughest, fairest, bipartisan border security legislation in modern history. And congressional Republicans decided to block it because Donald Trump felt like it would make Americans safer, so do not move forward with it. That's what he felt. Uh, or it, And it would harm him politically. That's what he felt. Uh, and so, look, we did a deal. It was a very good deal that uh, that Republicans agreed on, Democrats agreed on. The president reached across the aisle to make this happen when people told him that that wouldn't be possible. And the former president got in the way. Uh, and it was he got in the way not because it was the right thing to do for the American people. It was the right thing to do for himself. And so the president would love, would love to move forward with that deal with that deal that we were able to get done. But they themselves, Republicans, voted twice against it. And so the president's taken executive actions, uh, and, uh, and we want to make sure that we continue to reduce uh, unauthorized crossing to lower, and we've been able to do that, to lower than any other, uh, any, under any other prior administration. We have been able to do that through actions here. But in order to deal with this, we have to have legislation. And there was a deal. There was a deal on the table that we were able to negotiate with Republicans and Democrats in the Senate. The former president got in the way. You know? Will that deal still be on the table after the election? I, I, it's, it's on the table right now. We want to make that deal move forward. We do. We are ready. The president's ready to sign it. It's Republicans. This is really, I, I appreciate the questions, but this is really a question for Republicans in Congress to, to, to answer to. Um, okay, guys, we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>